Thanks, y'all. Give it up for, uh, for our, our team, our worship team this morning, holding it down. Can I, can I just give a special shout out to Kirby? She's up here dedicating a baby. She's up here con- holding a family down on the floor, then just boom, right into worship. You're amazing. Um, awesome. Awesome. It's a mess, y'all. Don't think it's not a mess, but we're here. We're doing it. Come on. I got a couple of announcements for you. Can I do that? And then I'm going to preach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some quick announcements, and then I'm going to preach. I've got like a burst of announcements, all related. They're all one thing. Uh, before I do that, though, hey, if we have any students in the house, middle or high school students, you are hereby dismissed uh, to student ministry. We've got Ashley and Stephen in the back of the room over here by the cafe waving. Look at them. Um, they would love to hang out with any middle and high school students uh, for the remainder of the gathering. All right, few announcements for you guys. Easter's coming. I don't know if you guys know this. Easter and Holy Week, everything Easter related. Okay, so we've got an Easter schedule I want to make you aware of. We are doing a Stations of the Cross experience during Holy Week. That's April 11th through 14th, Monday uh, through the end of that week, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. That's Monday through Thursday, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Here, you can come here during your lunch break or whatever, that that two-hour period, and have a, a, a reflective, prayerful experience of the Stations of the Cross. Uh, so we'll, we'll, you'll see kind of what we have planned for that. It's going to be really special. That's a great time. If you, have a, if you can carve out a little time and you want to like get quiet, get alone, and really reflect on the journey of Jesus to his death and see what God is doing in your heart through that experience, come on up. Then we're going to do a Good Friday gathering here, April 15th at 6 p.m., And uh, that's going to be amazing. Excited about that. And then Easter Sunday is coming, y'all. Easter Sunday, it's coming. April 17th, we're going to do a 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. gathering. So as you know, we do a 1 10 a.m. gathering right now. You're here for it, right? Uh, We're going to do a 9 and 11 that Sunday just to make a little more room for people. Um, And part of making room for people, let me just give this call. If, If you call Grace Midtown home, either you're a partner here with us or you've been really just receiving from God in this time and, and you want to, you feel a nudge to um, give something back or make, a, make an investment even for a day, we need people to serve on the team in those gatherings at 9 and 11 on Easter. We really want to be a hospitable, like an overwhelming hospitable presence because Easter Sunday is a day when a lot of new people come to church and, um, and check things out. And so we want to receive people and make them feel loved and seen and known and welcomed. And so uh, we would love for you to sign up for the team, even just for that one day. If you've never served on a Sunday, um, serve on that one day and, and you won't get just like, we're not going to hit you up with uh, a million spam emails every two days afterwards. Like, where are you coming back this Sunday? How about the next one? How about, like you can do just a trial run that Sunday and give it a shot and see what happens. And then maybe, maybe you will join the team in a more um, rhythmic, consistent basis afterward. But there's no expectations for that. Come serve that Sunday, make it happen, be with us, and let's, um, let's bless some people as they come in to, to meet Jesus that day. Is that cool? You with me on that? I think it's going to be amazing. It's going to be so much fun. We've got a lot of awesome stuff planned for around the property that day. Plan to be with us, and please plan to, to serve on the team if you're available. All right. That's my announcements. Y'all ready for this? Can we restart the clock for me? I know we started the clock tonight when I started doing announcements. I got a little clock up here so I don't go too long. Um, That's just for me, not for you, but now you know. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Y'all, it's a good day. I'm I'm really excited about this message. I've been, uh, when we planned this series, this is a passage I really looked forward to preaching. Um, And so so here we go. We're going to be in John 5, starting in verse 1. It'll be on the screen. We're just going to read this together now. Sometime later. Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he'd been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Somebody say, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, 
pick up your mat and walk. And once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who'd been healed, it is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick up, pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. All right, this is our passage today. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? I just want to give you, I'm going to start off with a spoiler. Can I do that? Can I give you a little spoiler? I'm so excited about where this message is going. I'm just going to tell you where it's going. All right. So here's a few things you need to know. There is some place in your life where Jesus is asking you, do you want to get well? He's actually asking you, do you want to get well in this area? Do you want to experience wholeness in this area? Do you want healing in this area? Do you want to get well? That's one thing you need to know. Another thing is this. There is some story that you've been telling yourself that you are stuck on. You are stuck on a story in some Probably, and somewhere, I'm not going to speak it over you, but most likely there's some story that you're stuck on in your life, all right, and that God wants to speak to that. And the third thing you need to know is that grace, the grace of God is intending for you to grow in some place in your life. The grace of God is meant to lead you to growth in some area of your life right now. So just note these three things. There's some area where, where Jesus is asking, where do you, do you want to get well? There's most likely some story that you're stuck on that's holding you up in your life right now. And the grace of God is meant to lead to growth in you and in your life. You with me? We cool with this little spoiler? Okay, we're gonna have, we have processing questions that we do every week and those will be connected to our processing questions. So you'll get to see those again in just a little bit. All right, so Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? What a question. 38 years This guy's been laying on a mat and Jesus shows up and says, he doesn't say, stand up and walk and carry your mat and walk right off the bat. He doesn't impose healing on the guy. He doesn't just show up and sneak, he doesn't sneak up on him. There are people who sneak up on Jesus and get what they want in the gospels, touch the hem of his garment. Jesus doesn't sneak up on him though. Jesus shows up. And he asks him the most obvious question possible. It's like a duh moment. Do you want to get well? Let me just start by saying, it is really important for us to be able to say what we want. I wonder, can you say what you want in life? Are you able to to like admit it? (laughs) I'm not talking about desires that you shouldn't have or that you're ashamed of. I'm talking about like, what, like what's in your heart? What do, you, what do you really long for? What are you desiring? What do you want from God? What do you want out of life? What do you want next in your life? What do you want in the relationship that you're in with somebody? Can you say what you want? Most of us struggle to actually name what we want. Most of us struggle to even get in touch with it. Like, I don't even know what I want. Some of us are waiting for somebody else to tell us what to want. Some of us are like, I don't know, Instagram knows. I get these ads and I'm like, that's what I want. <laughs> I didn't know I wanted that, but I just, I, I bought it and it's at my house now. <laughs> Do you know what you want? Can you, admit, can you name it? Can you say it? There is something, to, to say what you want is so empowering. It's liberating. And it is challenging. But actually, I don't know that we can even relate healthily to ourselves, to the world around us, to the people in our life, or to God until we can actually name, this is what I want. Because when you can name what you want, that means you're beginning to take responsibility for your life. And responsibility might feel like a heavy word, like you're, like you're responsible for everything. You're not responsible for everything that's ever happened to you or for everything that would describe or define where you're at in life right now. But you have some responsibility in your life. Maybe a better word is agency. We begin to see ourselves as having, as having agency in our life and in our world. We're not just passively, life isn't just happening to us. 
You have agency in your life. You can choose a lot of stuff. There's things that you, can't cho- you cannot make a decision on. There are things that are out of your control, that are circumstances that are deeply impacting your life right now. But there's a lot of stuff that you can choose. You get to make decisions. You are here right now. You're here in this city, most likely by some choice. You, are an, you have agency in your life. And when you begin to name what you want, you're able to claim that agency. And I believe actually begin to live uh, as, a, as a mature person following Jesus. And so Jesus shows up and he says, do you want to get well? And get this, the guy's response isn't yes. The guy's response is an explanation for why he's still sick. Do you want to get well? And he says, he says, sir, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. He's got a story. And he's stuck on this story. Do you want to get well? He's defensive. Do you want to get well? He takes it as like a, why aren't, he, he's taking it as, why aren't you well? You want to get well? I have no one to help. I'm, there's no one to help. I'm all alone over here. Everyone's abandoned me. No one cares. There's no one to help me into the pool, sir. And the pool is the answer. <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. The pool, I need the pool. And I can't get into the pool. And there's no one to help me into the pool. And every time I try to get to the pool and the water starts, somebody else gets to the pool before me. And there's no pool left for me. What's the story that you're stuck on? We all have some little story. This is, this is what happened to me. And you can replace, do you want to get well with all kinds of questions. Do you want to be happy? Ooh, Rob, don't. Do you actually want to be happy? Well, you don't understand. This thing happened to me last year, and there's a pandemic, hello, Ambient anxiety, like there's like, and these things are true. There's like true stuff happening. This thing happened to me as a child. That really happened to you. That's not, an, I'm not invalidating that. Jesus isn't invalidating it. Whatever the thing is, do you want, do you want what you say you want? Do you want that dream that you told me you wanted? Remember that time you said, this is the thing that I feel like God's calling me to, and then you didn't do it? Do you want it? You don't understand, I'm really busy. You don't understand, I don't quite make enough money to, or you don't understand when I, you know, I, when I, when I, when I get into the next life stage, let's talk life stages for a minute, right? If I were to ask you right now, one-on-one, like, first, if I were to just ask you, what do you want? Would your response, your natural response be an explanation of your current life circumstances? I'm just coming at, I mean, coming in hot right now. We're, we got a lot going on. <laughs> We've got, all got a little story that we're stuck on. I think the question that this begs for me is, are you more committed to why you're sick than how you're going to get well? Are you more committed to why you're sick than how you're going to get well? And here's the thing is, I get it, like, there's, when life is hard or when you're dealing with a really difficult thing or you're down or you're depressed or you're sick or you're like, there's like, you feel downtrodden and beaten up by life. Sometimes the only source of comfort is self-pity. I have felt that. I felt it slip into my life at times. I felt God even call it out of me and go, hey man, you're going to get, you're going to prolong. <laughs> you're going to prolong this difficult thing. <laughs> The, the, if you keep applying this energy to it. Sometimes, sometimes that little comfort, the little like self-pity thing is the, is the best that we can find. And we, we, continue, we start to go back to it. We get stuck. We get stuck on a story. The thing that happened to you, the thing that you did that caused your current situation, the thing that that person did to you, the thing that's happening in the world, the thing that happened for everybody else but not for you. Somebody else gets to the pool first. There's not enough to go around. Do you see the scarcity in this guy's way of thinking? 
Are you more committed? You might want to write this one down. Are you more committed to why you're sick than how you're going to get well? Or replace sick and well with whatever words actually describe where you're at. Are you more committed to why you're blank than how you're going to get blank? Sometimes we just like, we, we identify so much with the thing that we're going through. And we actually like choose to define ourselves by it. This guy has been in this state for 38 years. So some of us were stuck on a story. Also, we get attached to our issues. We get attached to our issues. I know, this is a good sermon. Some of you are like, dang, I need to write that one down too. <laughs> 38 years. Sometimes the issues we've had the longest are the ones we're most attached to. The short-term issues, we're able to like, we can get past that. We can listen to a motivational speech. We don't even need Jesus to get past that one. You're like, I saw like an Instagram reel that I just, I got over that on Tuesday. It was amazing. Some lady was just like talking really forcefully about how I can overcome my, th- my stuff. And I did. <laughs> it's great. The short-term stuff, sometimes we can get out of that. But the long-term issues, we get attached to our issues. And, and this becomes part of the story. We start to say, oh, I've always been this. I've always been too shy to whatever. I've always been uh, bad at relationships. I've always been too much. I've always been too loud. Or I've always been a slow learner. I've always been, I've been a bad student. I've always been bad in relationships. Whatever the, I've always been this. I've always had this. I'm a t- I begin to define myself by this issue because, I don't know, some, I took a personality test when I was 17 years old, so this is who I am for the rest of my life. And you got, you're dealing with current short-term circumstances, but you're probably, you're actually dealing with long-term issues in that circumstance. And the stuff that we don't heal and don't really let Jesus heal as we lean into it, that's the stuff that comes back up in a new form, in a new season, in a new relationship. And that's the old adage, wherever you go, there you are. You can go to a new city, you can go to a new, new state, you can go to a new job, you can go to a new relationship. You can get divorced this month and marry someone else and your issues don't get left in the lawyer's office when you sign those papers. They come with you. We get attached to our issues. Sometimes the issues we've had the longest are the ones that we're most attached to. They're going to keep coming up, keep coming up, keep coming up. And it's easy to let them define us. In fact, the, I, I don't know if you see what John's doing here, but John is, def, is referring to the guy as the invalid. This is identity in this story until his identity is the man who was healed in verse 13. 38 years. So why does he want to get into this pool so bad? Let's talk about the pool. That's the title of the message, pool. So the image, we're in a series called Image of God in the Gospel of John, and we're looking at a different image. There we go. That's cute. <laughs> why, why is this guy wanting to get into this pool? There's a couple of things happening here. First of all, there's a superstition that is um, defining how people think about this pool, why people are gathered here. So there's, I don't know if you saw this, we skipped verse four when we were reading. So we go, the, the, verse, the, the passage goes straight from verse three to verse five, because verse four um, wasn't in the earliest manuscript. Someone added it later to describe what was happening here. You probably have a footnote in your Bible. It says this, some manuscripts include here that it would pick up and say, hey, here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and then secret verse four, hidden verse four, erased verse four, for a reason, holy or in part, paralyzed, and they waited for the moving of waters. From, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturb- disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Why is that in the footnotes? Well, someone put that in there in, in later manuscripts to describe some folklore around this pool and why people would gather there. And so maybe it, maybe it was never actually something that people thought, and it was added like, generations later to describe it because of some, you know, just legend or whatever that was around the story, or maybe it was actually why all these people were there, but it was removed from the verse because it's just, it's actually not true, right? The answer is not that you get into the 
lucky pool when the angel stirs it. But, but this guy's going, whenever the, but he says, whenever the water's stirred, I can't get there in time. So it seems like, yeah, maybe he's, he's believing this mythology of the angel. It's superstition. If I get to this place at this time, then magically, it's magic, right? Magically, I'll be better. Superstition. I wonder, do you know the difference between superstition and the Holy Spirit? This is important for us. Do, we know, do I know? Or are there ways that I'm like, I've still got some superstition in my faith and in my theology of how things work or how God works? Because the, the, the reality is the one who makes well is standing there in front of him. The real pool is there in front of him. That's what John's doing with all this imagery. Jesus is the pool. The spirit is the one hovering over the waters in Genesis and stirring the waters up. There's a difference between mythology, between superstition and the Holy Spirit, and the one who can make well is asking you, do you want to get well? He's not asking you, can, hey, how come you haven't gotten to the pool yet? He's saying, dive in. I've come to you. You don't need to get there. This is good news, and it's so it's connected with all the passages leading up to it. We've been reading about the 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 the, the water j- jars for purification that were turned to wine. We've been reading about the the woman at the well, and Jesus is saying, "Hey, drink the water that I give, and you'll have a spring within you flowing to eternal life." Like there, this is all the same imagery that keeps showing up, and Jesus is saying, "Dive in to me. I'm right here with you. Do you want to get?" Do you know the difference between, between superstition and the Holy Spirit? Another thing that is happening here is um, there's a thought that this, these pools um, had a natural spring within them that had some, uh, some different like, like natural stuff in it. So uh, there's, there's a few scholars that think it might have been, I learned a new word this week, tell me if you know this word, that it might have been chalybeat water. Anybody know the word chalybeat? I was like, am I the only one who's never heard of this word before? Chalybeat? No one, no one knows what chally beat water. I'm the only one. I'm pretty sure I'm saying it right. I listened. I clicked a button to hear someone say chally beat on Google, so I could make sure I was saying it right. <laughs> chally beat water. It's water that is. This is the scientific term impregnated with iron. So there's natural iron deposits, and there's even thought that when the spring would sort of like move in the bottom and bubble up, the waters would get disturbed, and that there was even a red appearance to the water from the iron. It's like rust, rust water. <laughs> But it maybe had some therapeutic value. And so there's like natural springs you can still visit around the world that are chally beat springs. There's some in the UK you can go to. And it's like, I don't know if it actually helps you, but someone's making some money, you know. So it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, come, come hang out in these natural springs. It's kind of like essential oils, you know. I'm, I, <laughs> Just kidding, I'm kidding. We have a lot of them, all right? We have all the oils that I know. Like, if I cook bacon and the house smells bad, peppermint and citrus makes my wife happy, okay? She does not like the way the house smells when I cook bacon. So I know that works. And, like, there's something you can, if you have a little headache, you can put a little right here. Like, but look, Melaleuca is not going to heal a broken back, all right? (laughs) Maybe there's some therapeutic value is the point I'm making. Maybe there's some pseudo-medicinal value to the Chally Beat Springs. But this guy who's been on a mat for 38 years is not going to start walking because he got to that into that water. It might make your sore muscles feel better or something, you know? It is not going to heal something that big and that deep. You with me? You with me? So there's the, there's the superstition. There's the pseudoscience. <laughs> And then there's also this note that it's thought that this was a pagan worship site before um, the temple was there uh, because of that, the spring that had some potentially therapeutic value, right? And so there was a, it was a site um, that was uh, dedicated, once dedicated to the healing god Asclepius. It's the name of this healing god, As- Asclepius, Asclepius. Um, and so paganism, N.T. Wright talks about this in relation to this passage. I think he brilliantly communicates that paganism looks to the created world and seeks to harness the forces within it for its own ends. That's what paganism is doing. 
But Jesus shows up and he doesn't, he doesn't leverage one thing in creation for another in this moment. He enters and he begins a new creation. This is what he's doing. This is John's narrative through the gospel of John. A new creation is being birthed and is growing out of the old order. And Jesus comes in and he's not saying, oh yeah, use the, use the chally beat water. Use the, yeah, there's an angel over here who's gonna stir it up or, or there's this magical nature to this pool. No, he's entering in and he's saying, you don't even need to get into that pool. He doesn't help him to the pool. This guy has been fixated on a solution. Some of you, your prayer, your biggest prayer is God help me get the thing that is gonna help me get what I need and you're fixated on a solution, and Jesus is not gonna help you get that because it's not actually what you need. He's saying, I'm the pool. And I, we could so get cliche and reductionistic in Sunday school and just say, Jesus is the answer. Bye, you know, and just leave, and like, we don't actually, you're just like, I get it, but I'm praying, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> Are you open, though, to different solutions than what you've been fixated on? Sometimes Jesus will lead you to a different solution that will bring about healing in your life. Some of you, you actually know what next steps you need to take, but you haven't. Some of you have not considered that maybe you need to reach out to that counselor. And Jesus like, is actually prompting you to do that. Some of you, Jesus is saying, have you thought about it? this way? Have you thought about taking this step? What about this path? He's fixated on a solution, stuck on a story, attached to an issue, fixated on a solution. Got to get to the pool, got to get to the pool. There's something about that chally beat water thing, like, I just want to get in and like, it's like a, it's like a spa, you know? Like, I need the spa. It's like self-care. I just need, you know what, I really just need is some self-care. And that self-care is great. It's important. Um, some of us, though, we are, our hope or our expectation is that God would just bring comfort to us rather than healing. And there's actually a difference between hospice and a hospital. Hospice, see Miss Janie over here, you worked in Columbus Hospital. You, you, I, I used to see you out there when I was a... Um, a pastor in Columbus. Uh, there's I've spent some time in hospices. I've spent some time in um, hospitals. Hospice is what happens, what they bring in or where, you, where someone goes when you've reached a point in your condition where there's actually no hope to get better. And so the best we can do is, com is, is comfort until the end. And that's a really important thing that is needed for people. We don't want people suffering unnecessarily, especially at the end of life. Hospice is a beautiful thing. Hospitals, a hospital nurse is not there to make you feel good. They're going to make you get up and walk that hallway, even if it hurts. Anybody ever done physical therapy? Was, did that feel good? No? But it was for your, like, you don't, you don't recover without it, right? The point is, not, is actually not comfort. The point is, is healing. Um, I remember the first time I ever went to a counselor, he said, uh, and I was just like, I was like, man, I just want to get, I want to, I need some help here. I'm not really planning on talking about my childhood or anything. Let's just like get to the point. <laughs> I didn't know really what I was getting into. Um, he said, hey, this is the kind of work that'll, that'll make you sick before it heals you. Um, and it was true. Some stuff had to, had to come up before I could start moving, start walking. Some of us are looking for comfort when God is wanting to bring healing. So Jesus says, hey, pick up your mat and walk. Um, and I wonder what that's about. You might read that and be like, God wants him to have a testimony. He's gonna walk around and like, that's kind of how I naturally just read it. Like, oh yeah, I gotta carry your mat around so everybody knows you got healed. And no, I think actually what's happening here is Jesus is saying, you won't need to come back here. Like, take your mat with you. You don't need to save your spot anymore. You've had your little ticket in the queue to get to the pool for a long time. You don't need it. You can, you can drop out of the line. You don't need to save your spot. You don't need this real estate. Take your mat with you. 
move on. Move on. Some of us need to move on, let go. We're still, we're still saving that spot. We're still holding on to the, we're still committed to that solution that we were hung up on for a while. You don't need that real estate anymore. That old pool has no value to you anymore. Pick up your mat and walk. We're going to keep moving. There's some other stuff in the story I want to get to. So then, then he gets in trouble. Boom, twist in the story. He goes to the temple. It's during a, a, a festival, a Jewish festival in Jerusalem. Jesus is back in Jerusalem. This guy goes into the temple to worship during the festival. He's carrying a mat. The Jewish leaders get mad because he's carrying a mat on the Sabbath, and you're not supposed to carry it. You're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath. There's some argument out there around, like, was that, did that even count as doing work? It's not like he carried mats for a living. Like, you're, you're supposed to shut your business down on <laughs> the Sabbath. Like, he's just, he's there. He's carrying his mat, though, so he's, he, they get mad. And um, you ever notice Jesus heals a lot of people on the Sabbath? Like, he could have avoided a lot of trouble if he had just... This is, take note here, by the way, John talks about the seven signs, right? There's seven recorded miracles. This is the first one initiated by Jesus. The others are initiated by the person in need or somebody around Jesus. This one is the first one that Jesus goes up to the guy and says, hey, let's do something. And he knows it's a Sabbath. So it's kind of like he knows what he's, he, this is Jesus even initiating the ongoing struggle and battle he's going to have with the religious authorities for the rest of his ministry. He starts it, actually. <laughs> I think he knows what he's doing, right? So this guy is in the temple. The Jewish leaders, Pharisees are mad. Hey, um, so, oh, yeah, they say, the Jewish leaders, it's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. Have you ever noticed that sometimes people don't like it when you start getting well? Have you ever noticed that if you struggled to have boundaries in the past and then you start having boundaries that not everybody who was close to you likes that you have boundaries now? People, sometimes maybe there are people that like begin to depend on your lack of boundaries for their whatever, well-being. And they're like, hey, man, you've changed. This isn't you. This doesn't seem like you. And you go, I've been sick for 38 years. You don't know the well me. I don't even know the well me yet. I'm getting to know him. I'm getting to know her. Do you want to be a part of this? Sometimes the stat healing messes up the status quo. Wholeness disrupts the status quo whenever there's relationships or a system that's dependent on things being a little messed up, a little bit broken. I love that this detail is in here, though, that the, the Jewish leaders are mad that... Um, that he got healed. Because it tells me that, the, I love, the Bible includes these details. It shows me that people have always been a pain in the butt. That's the thing. It's not a new phenomenon. You're like, can I get, can I have a break here? Like, we're, like you don't like the way I'm, I'm coming into worship? You, Jewish leaders who are, you're here because of worship in the temple. And you don't like the way I'm, I'm, I'm here to do the thing that you're like all about. And you don't like the way I'm doing it? That was just a first century issue. You know, I was thinking about this. You know who the most dangerous person is to any local church? The president. No. <laughs> Someone who just met Jesus the most dangerous person to any local church. Someone who just got healed is the most dangerous person. Someone who just got filled with the Holy Spirit is the most dangerous. Someone who just heard from God in a way that changed their life is the most dangerous person to any local church because they're gonna disrupt the program. They're gonna show up and go, whoa, God is moving in a way. And you don't, do you guys know that God's like here? I've been that person. Now I'm crusty. I'm old. I'm, I'm the one. I've been following Jesus for 20 years, and I'm like, I need someone to mess things up. You know, I hope, I hope we have some messes over the next season in the life of this church. I hope some people meet Jesus, and they're like, why do we do it this way? And we're, we've always done it this way. And they're like, but why? And we're like, I don't know. I guess we should consider. Like, we, I, I hope we have some of that. <laughs> I hope that that's, that's what it means to be alive. That's what kids do. 
That's what babies do. They disrupt the status quo. Life is disruptive. Resurrection is disruptive. Healing is disruptive. Got one more thought here. Jesus shows up. This is a weird ending to the story. Jesus shows up and says, see you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. What? I, when, I was, when I was preparing to preach this message, I was like, John, why'd you put that in there? <laughs> like, this, this would have been a lot better of a story if he hadn't said that. <laughs> like, that's really what I was thinking. <laughs> like, well, this doesn't even sound, I think it's because I realized, like, oh, this doesn't fit my view of Jesus. Like, the picture I have of Jesus in my mind is not him after he's healed somebody showing him and going, better stop saying Like, this feels weird. Like, it, like I, and all we have is the words on the page, right? We don't have, like... And in, in the scriptures say, if, you know, chapter four, Jesus knows what's in their hearts and stuff. So he's interacting with people based on like what he knows is there that we can't see. So there's context, right, that I don't know. But the, the, it's a strange ending to the story. Um, I read a bunch of commentaries about this. I was, I was actually kind of dissatisfied with everything I read explaining this. So everybody's kind of got a different take on why this verse is in here. It's important to note. So, I mean, there's some thought of like, well, was the guy sick because of sin? Was he in the state he was in because of some sin in his life and, and Jesus heals them and then him and then implicit in the healing is forgiveness and now Jesus is calling him to a new way of life and saying, hey, don't, like, don't get back where you were by just continuing the way you were. And, and so, but there's an important question of like, especially in, in, at this time in history of, of, of are people in the state that they're in because of their own sin? It's easy to judge someone who's in a bad condition because of, and just assume they did this to themselves. And so this comes up a few chapters later where there's a blind guy and, Jesus, and the disciples say, hey, who sinned, this guy or his parents that made him blind? And Jesus says, neither, but so that you might see the glory of God. Be healed. And so the, that, that question is answered. Okay, it's not just that somebody, every bad thing that happens to somebody or every bad physical condition somebody's in isn't because of sin. And we kind of know, that, like, of course, that was an important question at that time, though. But then there is this, there is some sin that makes you sick, too. You know? There's some things that we do that lead to a state that we don't want to be in. And um, I don't... It's unclear exactly what's happening here, what the dynamic is here. At the very least, maybe Jesus is showing up so the guy knows who he is and he's just saying something. <laughs> and so the, the guy can go, it was that guy, it was Jesus. <laughs> he is providing that. He's identifying himself as the healer at the end of the story. But the, the, the kind of running theme with this guy is that he is not taking responsibility for anything in the story. Do you want to get well? No, there's no one to help me. The Jewish leaders say, hey, you're not allowed to do that. And he says, that guy told me to. Like he's deflecting. That was a neo move. Him. So I don't even know where, it's some guy, okay? He told me to do it. <laughs> and, and Jesus shows up, and, and it, after a moment of sheer grace and gift, Jesus says something that places responsibility on this man moving forward. Hey, you've been set free from the condition that defined your experience of reality for 38 years. Live differently. It's kind of like, hey, kindness, let kindness lead you to repentance, as it's been said. I actually love that. You don't need to repent to experience the kindness of God. But his kindness compels us. And we see it, some people get their lives changed by Jesus and their natural impulse is, you know, Zacchaeus is like, I'm giving it all back. Jesus doesn't have to tell him, hey, you like extorted 
money from your people. What are you going to do to make that right? You know, like there's none of that. He just goes, oh man, I've wronged people. You can have it all back. In fact, I'm giving more away. Like there's a natural impulse in some, in, in this individual, it's like he maybe needed a little bit of a challenge. Like, hey, it's kind of like you had $50,000 in credit card debt and someone said, I want to pay that off for you. You bought the jet ski, <laughs> but I, I want to pay this off. He's like, you made that, is it? whatever. I don't know how many people have. Anyway. <laughs> but then like a year later, that person has $100,000 in credit card debt. Like does the grace gift does it just bail you out so you can stay the same? Or does it prompt a transition in your life? And this is the point that I made at the beginning. Grace is meant to lead to growth. Am I growing? Am I growing? And I've got to take responsibility for my growth. Grace means that I, I, it's not on me to get myself out of, the, out of the state that I'm in, even if it was my fault. The grace of God, oh, it's so good, so far reaching. And that grace is meant to, it's actually meant to be an inflection point in the timeline of your life so that you don't just keep going straight anymore, but there's a pivot and you are moving in a new direction than you were before. Is grace leading to growth in my life? I wanna do this, I'm gonna invite the band up. And um, we're going to respond in a few different ways. But there's something I, f- I just was feeling this morning as I was praying. And it's something that this guy says specific to his um, response to the question, do you want to get well? And it's this. He says, um, he says, I have no one to help me. I have no one to help me. And I wonder if that's part of the story for you. And that's even part of the lie that you've believed is that you're alone. And this is an easy one. This is one that that we often get caught up on. We just actually begin to believe we're alone in the world. We begin to believe we're alone in our issues. We begin to believe that that we're alone in our pain, that we're alone in our sin, that we're alone in our shame and our guilt, that we're just alone. And we suffer alone. And part of the good news, first of all, is that, that God calls us into community it's not his desire. It's not, his, it's not good for man to be alone in Genesis 2 even. Like he gives us each other, right? And God is with you right now, right where you're at. Um, you don't have to get to some pool to find him. You don't have to pack up and get to another town to find him. You don't have to live somebody else's life to find him. Somebody else gets there before me. If I was them, maybe. I wonder if there's anyone who's been caught up in that that lie in the story that you've been stuck in. We also want to respond just with some prayer. So I mean, part of what happens here is uh, Jesus heals the guy (laughs) and he's free. (laughs) He's healed. And we still believe in healing here at Grace Midtown. We believe that the power of God is just as present now as it was in the first century. We believe that as Jesus spoke, as the disciples prayed, as they did greater things than him, as the Holy Spirit moved on the day of Pentecost and throughout the book of Acts, we believe we're still living in that, right? And so we just want to create some space for for prayer, for healing. Maybe there's a physical need you actually have, and maybe you've prayed a lot. This, by the way, is not a sermon about unanswered prayers. That was last week. Kirby preached it. It was amazing. Go back and listen to that. But maybe you've prayed a lot, and it's like, okay, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll pray again. She said last week, you know, the only thing worse than unanswered prayers is unprayed prayers. So maybe there's some prayers that you haven't dared to pray yet and you need someone to pray with you. So we're gonna have some folks that are willing to pray for you uh, in front of this back wall here, the, the, the sunset looking wall. Um, some of our staff and team will be back here to pray for you if you'd like prayer during this worship response time. And we just wanna believe that um, God can intersect our life with his love and his grace and his power. Now, today, today could be the day after 38 years. Today could be the day after a lifetime of being stuck. Healing is a process and sometimes it's a moment and we just wanna make room for both. 
So Jesus, we, uh, we wanna follow you. We wanna, we wanna fix where we've been fixated on another solution. We wanna fix our eyes on you, Jesus. We wanna commit to you to follow. We wanna believe that you're, you actually are the answer and you possess the answers and the solutions to everything that we're dealing with. And so we, we wanna to look to you now. We worship you, commit ourselves to you again and ask that you would meet us and you would lead us. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.